morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our fifth live session by Outdoor Wilderness and Learning, OW in short. Every week, we organize a one-on-one -on -one talk with eminent personalities who share their perspective on business and life and try to make sense of a world where COVID-19 will be a reality for a long time to come. It's a world full of uncertainties. For some, that induces fear and foreboding. Some embrace it like a long lost friend and revel in the opportunities the situation creates. It's as if they have trained their entire lives for such an eventuality. Today, we have with us a person who thrives in the unknown, who has learned to take decisions in uncertainty. For any indecision or a split second delay on his part could literally be a matter of life and death. That's the zone in which he operates. It's my honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker, the unassuming and inspiring Satyarup Siddhanta. Satyarup was asthmatic since childhood. That didn't stop him from pursuing a goal that most ordinary mortals only dream of. Not only did he dream big, but he also overcame his greatest fear and surmounted all obstacles as he relentlessly pursued his goal. Several years later, he was on top of Mount Everest. But did he stop? No. He continued till one day he became the youngest mountaineer in the world to climb both the seven summits and the seven volcanic summits. These are the highest peaks in each continent. But let's hear the story from the man himself. So let me welcome Satyarup on today's one-on-one -on -one session with us. Hello, Satyarup. Which mountain are you climbing today? Oh, I am climbing a mountain called Life. Hi, Avik. How are you? I'm doing very well, Satyarup. Good to hear you. That's wonderful. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a request to everybody, Satyarup's talk will be followed by a QA and a round. So please feel free to send your questions on YouTube. Uh, Satyarup, uh, your session today is embracing uncertainty. Right. You're a mountaineer and you've been up in the mountains most of your adult life, so to say. And at every single step, you've probably been meeting uncertainty, but every single time you've taken a decision. And that decision has been the difference between life and death on, on top of these uh, high altitude uh, uh, mountains. So what's today's session going to be all about? Oh, we will uh, go through a great session and experience uh, sharing today. And uh, uh, I, I don't hope, but I believe that the audience will like it and can relate uh, to a situation that we are going through in these extraordinary times. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We can't wait to hear about your experience in Satyaryu. So over to you. It's all yours now, Satyaryu. Thank you, uh, Avik. And uh, what we are going to do is we'll go through a uh, uh, presentation and we'll sh share some experiences and then we'll have uh, some question and answer sessions. So, Absolutely. Yeah, uh, today we are talking about uncertainties and uh, that's the secret recipe. Let's see how. And thanks uh, Owl for giving me this opportunity to interact with, uh, uh, with such a vibrant audience here. Okay. Um, right. So VUCA, we must have by now heard this term a zillion times, especially in these COVID times. And trust me, yes, um, we are indeed living in a world of uh, VUCA where uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, this has become a part and parcel of our life. Uh, but is it new? Not at all. It was always there, but we never wanted to uh, like, you know, accept that or we never got an opportunity to experience that uh, like, you know, the way we are experiencing now. Now, let me tell you that while we are in the mountains, the only certain thing that we have is the uncertainty. So why is that? Like, you know, because in the mountains, uh, suddenly when everything looked perfect, everything, suddenly one earthquake might come and then avalanche can trigger and the entire camp can be washed off. Suddenly the weather, which was supposed to be, the forecast was supposed to be the perfect weather for your summit, weather might turn totally a 180 degree um, angle and uh, things might go drastically wrong. But then what do we do about it? We just 
go through it. We just step into that uncertainty and we embrace that uncertainty. And let's see how. Now, this is the typical uh, known unknown quadrant that we, uh, we might have seen before. And uh, trust me that we have been living in the comfort zone always and we love to live in this particular comfort zone when it is known, known. Like everything has to be planned, everything. Like, you know, I take this step, I know that what is the exact implication of this step. But then comes the unknown, unknown segment, which is marked with the pink. And then what happens in this is like we get scared. Because as soon as we are out from our comfort zone, we as human beings are like, you know, resistant to change, most of us, right? Now, there are certain people like the sports people, like the mountaineers who deliberately, and the entrepreneurs who deliberately take that step into that unknown, unknown zone because they know that that is the breeding ground for the winners. That is the breeding ground for the achievers. Now, why do I say that? Tell me, would you have appreciated uh, uh, Sachin Tendulkar playing only the weak teams uh, of uh, uh, Arab Emirates and uh, uh, the current Zimbabwe and uh, um, the past Bangladesh and all? Sachin Tendulkar wouldn't have been a great one, right? Sachin Tendulkar was born because he fought all the best of the best teams where you don't know like how many kilometers per hour the Shoei Bakhtar ball will come. Wasing Akram and uh, Brett Lee and Alan Donald, like you might have seen that, right? Now, some people are also pushed into that because of situations. Now, how many times have you taken a drastic decision in your life when you are in that known, known zone? When everything is going fine, why do you want to take it? Why do you want to change it? Like, no, it's working, let it be like that, right? So all your career decisions happened mostly, I'm not saying all, but mostly the career decisions that happen when you are pushed into certain situation, when you are like, you know, uh, put to the wall and there is no, no other place to go and uh, you take that jump and, uh, and you take the leap of faith, right? And majority decisions that I have also taken, I have taken from that zone when I have been pushed or deliberately have made myself into that particular situation, right? Now think of uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Had he not been pushed out of that train, it wouldn't have, might not have occurred that he will bring a drastic change in, uh, in our country. Or uh, see, maybe it is uh, Nelson Mandela, unless and until he was uh, put in the jail like that, uh, he wouldn't have transformed himself to make such a huge impact in our society, isn't it? Now, we understand from our side when we deliberately get into a situation where it is unknown, unknown. But let's see, what is the life cycle when somebody is pushed into that particular situation? So when we are pushed into a situation of unknown, unknown, the first thing comes is the denial. No, 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 this all is well, all is well. <laughs> this can't be. And then comes the fear and the shock and like, oh my God, how am I going to handle this? It's not my cup of tea. And like, you know, most of the time, we just flee from there. Uh, and then comes the anger. The ego is hurt, but it's like, how could this happen to me? Like, you know, how could they do to me? And I will show them. And this, the anger comes in. And the frustration, you know, that, and it's like, you will start blaming each and every person that because of him, because of that, because of her. But we seldom forget to point it to us. <laughs> and uh, then we comes uh, that uh, the anxiety. Anxiety is different from fear. Anxiety is that we try to anticipate a future memory, which is uh, not so pleasant. And we get scared seeing, thinking that that is going to be the reality. Now this goes in loop, goes in loop. Now the faster you get out of this loop, the faster you transform. But then is fear bad? Is this anger bad? No, I have a, uh, like, you know, a lot of people ask me that, are you fearless? That when you went to all these mountains, I said, no, I am damn scared. You know, when I, the very thought came to my mind that I have to go and climb Mount Everest and I was like, oh my God, like, and, but that fear, I didn't allow me, allow it to uh, freeze me, to crumble me, but I have used that fear as the fuel to propel me forward. So that fear, I have used it 
that I wake up every morning, early morning to go for that extra run, to go for that extra exercise, to go for that extra lap of swimming is driving from that fear that I don't want to die there, right? So all these things, the fear, anger, frustration, if you take it as an opponent, it will crumble you. But if you take it as the components for you to build that particular the fuming thing and then you can just propel on, all you have to do is first is that acceptance. Yes, things are not right. All is not well. Because only when you know, when you accept it that all is not well, then only will take some steps or they will, then only will be identifying what is wrong or what is not right. And then you will take the next step and next step, next step. So then you dive into that unknown, dive into that, like an you know, venture into that unknown and you accept and then comes the growth mindset. Earlier it would be the victim mindset. Now it will become your growth mindset. And as you get into that mindset, you will get to see the transformation happening and there's a shift that happens that now you are no more scared. Now you are no more uh, having that anxiety. Now you know that, okay, shit has happened. What's next? That what's next comes from that reflection. And then you start redesigning. You start planning again. You start strategizing and you take massive action now because you desperately want to like you don't you want to you want to uh, question you want to question the uh, status quo right you don't want to stay there and circling and circling and you take that massive action and that you'll get to see the breakthrough now this has been my life uh, thing as well when i was diagnosed with asthma when i was uh, in class 2 and uh, life, uh, I accepted the life the way it was. And uh, I used to be in the victim mindset and I, my playground was taken away from me. My football ground was taken away from me, but I chose my playground. My playground was uh, climbing some trees and jumping from some under construction houses from the first floor to the sand below and all those things. And people used to like, I used to be on the nerves of people and like, uh, but then this went on till my college days and I studied from Manipal's engineering college in Sikkim. One fine day I had uh, this asthma attack and it was so common, like, you know, I was uh, so comfortable with that. And I reached out for my inhaler only to find that for the first time in many years, I forgot my inhaler in my pocket. And the next 10 minutes, I was just rolling in the road, trying to gasp for some air, some breath. And it was like, as if a fish was taken out from the water. And I was like, literally I thought that I'll be dying. But what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And uh, I didn't die, but that day I reflected on the whole thing. And I decided that I am not going to accept the life that has been thrown to me. And I started challenging my life. And I started not to use the inhaler, not to keep the inhaler in my pocket again. Now with that, now, the, if you see the trigger point was a lot of anger, a lot of negative emotions, a lot of frustration, a lot of pity. Everything was like, you know, fuming. And that made me take this jump into the uncertainty. But what will happen if I don't take the inhaler? I don't know. But I, I am ready to take that plunge to accept life. Let's see what happens. And then I will decide. With that... Seven years I fought with asthma. And when I went to the first mountain, when I saw some pictures of a mountain, and those mountains were not the mountains from the Himalayas, not the mountains from the Alps or the Andes. That was a small hill in Tamil Nadu. And I was so fascinated and so fascinated by seeing that hill. And I decided to go and uh, go for the trek. But the fear was with me. And uh, I had to carry my inhaler. I bought a new inhaler and didn't tell anyone that uh, I have the inhaler. And finally we went to that particular hill. And when I climbed that particular hill in 2008, and that was my first trek ever at the age of 25, when I allowed myself to go into the uncomfortable zone, to go into the unknown, unknown zone, and I, I embraced the unknown, massive breakthrough happened. So I was so engrossed in the whole trail that I forgot that I had an, 
an uh, inhaler in my bag. I forgot that I was asthmatic. I forgot everything. Only when I reached to the top of that hill, then I realized, and when I was enjoying the view and the road was like a string, and I, I couldn't believe that I have, I, I came this much. And to be honest, I never thought that I am capable of climbing a hill like that. And just when I was in awe, I realized that I didn't have to use the inhaler not a single time. And that was such a liberating feeling for me. And as if like thousand doves was given a freedom and I realized that I am meant for something much bigger. And I knew that from that point of time that whatever I decide to do, I will do it. All I need to do is to convince myself that yes, it is possible. And that belief got cemented so much that there was no looking back. 2010, I went and uh, saw Mount Everest while I went for a uh, high altitude trip to Mount Everest base camp. And I was so fascinated by Mount Everest that without the, knowing the facts and figures, I promised Mount Everest that I'm going to come back. But what I'm saying is the small wins give you so much confidence that these becomes the foundation for the bigger dreams. And when I did that, eventually one fine day, I saw that I have climbed all these mountains all over the seven continents, the highest mountains of all the seven continents, the highest volcanoes of all the seven continents. And it didn't end there. I also skied to the South Pole. And for the last two years, I'm trying to go to the North Pole. Yes, this isn't a smooth journey at all. Like people who are, people who are just seeing this particular slide, they will think that, oh my God, wow. So beautiful, very nicely done but it had so much struggle to that extent that I had to go and do an auction of my stuff in Facebook to that op to that like, you know, to that situation where I didn't have money to go to my office. I had like 40 rupees left in my ATM. I used to skip meals and uh, one meeting was there at the office and I had to lend money from another office colleague who paid for my auto bill. There was like, you know, and I still have a loan of uh, more than 45 lakhs on me. But what I realized is that you see in this journey, what the mountains has taught me is to be resilient. What the mountains has taught me is the life skills. Yes, academic skills are important, but life skill is what can help you to glide through all the ups and downs of your life. Now think, if everything was known, like if I give you a book and I tell that, look, in this book, you have everything from today till your last day, you have everything written here. You will know exactly who is going to be your girlfriend and who you are going, when you are going to meet at what time and what is that particular girl's name and what are you going to tell and then exactly, you know, when is your kid is going to born and what, which school he is going to go and will you buy that book at 10 rupees also? You will not try to buy because we love uncertainties because uncertainty is in our DNA. Now, you might contradict this. How come it is in our DNA? Now, blame it on our uh, predecessors. Like, you know, I'm, I'm talking about from those people from our forefathers who used to go in four legs one day, one person might have uh, decided, let's see how does it feel to walk like in, in two legs instead of four legs. Did he succeed? We don't know, but maybe we can just imagine, maybe he failed. But that thought was enough. He tried and tried and tried and someday the evolution happened and people started to walk. Wasn't it an adventure? Was it in like, embracing an uncertainty. Forget that. Imagine the Indus Valley civilization. Everyone was comfortable there. Everything was fine. The, there was enough food. There was enough um, water. What made those people, uh, like what was there in their mind that, that they ventured into the unknown to find something, some new grounds, to find something for the unknown. But they were the adventurers and their gene we are carrying, so we are also adventurous. And that's why you see that a lot of people are going and uh, trying to venture into something new, 
going to do something new and these are all adventure and adventure doesn't mean that you have to go to a mountain or go to a jungle any small thing that shifts you that takes you out from your comfort zone into the unknown is adventure for me now when you go through this kind of situation like this is mount denali i want to take that first step if your why is not defined you will turn back from here if your why is not strong enough you will think oh my god i have someone at house what if i fall down what if i like you know both the sides of course uh, it's like abyss and uh, the winds blows here like almost 80 km per hour and you were just tied with your team members with a rope and also with an invisible rope called faith and trust and with that if your step is wobbly you will not be able to cross this trust me so for here you need to have that strong belief system that is acquired over time with training and with experience and every step has to be with conviction there is no other way now what makes us go there like you know nobody has put a gun and say that you have to cross it now it is your why that has to be defined and that's why if that why is strong enough you will see it sustainable and that made me go through all this unknown and face this unknown and uh, of course uh, that never let me to be complacent and uh, the innovations came in in the form of different mountains for me and i learned a lot a lot of people ask me that uh, what is your education qualification and i say that i am an mba and they say that uh, which university and i say uh, i did my mba from my mountains <laughs> why not because uh, while we plan for this expedition there's a lot of planning lot of execution lot of risk mitigation risk identification lot of marketing to get the funds uh, uh, in a country like india where cricket and football are the predominant uh, sports uh, to get the funds to get the uh, uh, like you know uh, the finances uh, you name it like you know name it name it any field of mba and it is there right and resource management and what not so that with that when we went to the mount everest and this is the most um what we call the most dangerous section of mount everest called the khumbu ice fall now why is it so dangerous uh, the statistics says it that most of the deaths that happen on mount everest happens in the section between base camp and camp 1 and most of the deaths that have happened within there also happened while coming back because people think that they achieved the goal by reaching to the top and that's it but that's half done you have to come back alive as well only then your goal is achieved so goal is apparently the top but goal is not just the top go there and come back now imagine every step is a vuka step right so in a game of cricket you might get hit by six sixes in one over but you can have a comeback you can take a hat trick uh, uh, in the next three deliveries as well and you can turn the thing game to your side but in mountains one small mistake is very like you know it, it cannot be accepted and you have to pay it you may have to pay it with your life so here the stakes are pretty pretty high and here we don't we have to take decisions just like that should i go this should i go there like you know i cannot just wait okay let me think and boom <laughs> something might fall off now this looks so uh, unassuming it is not so dangerous right so let me take 1 mm of this section and let me zoom and if i zoom there you see that what it looks like now there are huge towers of ice and as big as two floor three floors and these are not straight towers but tilted towers and very very what you call unstable and we had to actually cross these sections in the night because during the daytime the sunlight can actually melt it and it can fall off now does it really fall off 2014 13 top shapers in the world were buried alive in one such areas when when avalanche happened and some of these towers just tumbled down and they were buried alive Now knowing this when you are venturing there 
you can hear your heart beat <laughs> dhak 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 and we are not supposed to even sneeze or not even cough here because it can create a vibration and it can fall out and you have to go inside now you have a choice do you want to go with lot of fear and lot of anxiety or do you want to accept it yes i have taken all the precautions i am going in the night i am going fast and i am going through a route that looks pretty good and i have the experience and i am the i have the skills so i have mitigated most of the risk here and when i go then the i enjoy the journey rather than getting bugged down by the um, uh, by the fear psychosis there right now as we cross this uh, uh, it turns to be a beautiful beautiful scenario and it is like amazing place silent place like you know you can hear your breath you can and this is a place i call it like you know it's a meditative place because you just take one step and the next step and a lot of thought comes initially and you acknowledge all those thoughts and you just become thoughtless at one point of time and it becomes only one thought that commitment to my dreams the commitment to reach to the top with security with safety and then with the why driving behind that the very strong why we go ahead and go ahead now when i thought that everything is now known everything i have mastered then let's see a video uh, and we'll see what happens next when i came here so this is timbaji showing us how to cross a ladder i have seen in the movies that there was a strong rope like a railing and you can walk on that but here there was no railing and i was like timbaji what is the fall what is this end up system collapses and timbaji says he smiles and says satyarup ji what if never went to the mountains now you have a choice you have to decide right now you want to go you have to take that step there is no other alternative if you don't have to go turn back but don't waste your time here because this is a dangerous section and you have to act and you have to decide and trust me the first step the first step was the most difficult step when i thought that how deep it is and how this thing is that when i went there and i took the first step all i could see was the rails and the narrow uh, ladder seemed to me like a highway because that i was so focused and when i took that first step i know that there is no turning back now i have to go and i went one after the other and the other and other right so all you need to do in the like you know in in this kind of situation take the first step when i thought everything is fine i look into this in the final day oh my god this was not in my syllabus because i have been trained to go in ah, you know this where it was daylight and everything and all god how can i go and then yeah i realize no no there if i focus only on the darkness i will get so much scared now let me try to find out what can be what can be the good thing in this darkness and then i realize the the good thing that in that can happen in this darkness is nothing so i identify three things and some of you are smart um, audience you might also know that what can be good number 1 because it is dark i can't see how deep it is now if if i can't see how deep it is so it doesn't exist so i don't have the fear so i tell okay 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 let me walk like you know second i can't see the face of my leading person because he might be scared like hell going like that but since i can't see his fear is uh, uh, face so i think that oh it's all is fine so let me go also because if the leader shakes it can be so contagious more than corona that that loss of confidence can propagate to the whole team the leader has to be very strong and in this case even though he is not strong but he it will as like you know because i cannot see his face it will assume that he is very strong and the entire team follows and we will just go strongly and the third one is because it was night i can't see how far i have to go so that is a huge psychological advantage that okay i don't need to see the oh my god so much far i have to go like you know so it's it gives oh yeah, yeah yeah it's just there so with that i realized that yes there can be darkness but let me try to find out what can be good 
in the darkness how can i use the darkness to my advantage and same goes in the current situation now in the current situation you might say that what can be the advantage of uh, corona like have you ever seen that have you ever reflected how many times uh, in the past you could have so much time to spend with your family how many times uh, and let me tell you some business insights as well like a lot of cars were parked and their battery got uh, like you know damaged because it was not used for so long and some companies some battery companies whom i know they have made crores of sales so all you need to find is the opportunity and act to it rather than lament and curse the corona what are you doing what steps are you taking in this uncertainty are you embracing the uncertainty or are you pushing it back and trying to be in that comfort zone staying in that comfort zone won't help at all right and there this is the camp four when we reached and this section is called the death zone why is it called death zone now any altitude above 8000 meter is called death zone because at this altitude every hour you spend every hour you spend thousands and thousands of brain cells are dying and body is killing itself because our human body is not accustomed to survive in that altitude right we are not tuned to operate well in that altitude so we have to go come back go come back and change your physiological we have to do a lot of changes in the composition of blood and all everything and that happens naturally and we have to give some time to our body to go through that and it's a cold graveyard i would say because there are a lot of dead bodies around uh, on the route and you know that your focus is to go to the top and to come back now at this point we have to use oxygen most of most of us has to use oxygen except a very handful few who uh, can survive without oxygen and we have to go and we operate like a zombie here now it takes lot of effort to take one step in this altitude now you go one step and like a zombie then you stop and you take the next step like a robot and you can breathe like you will be able to hear that breath and we have to be so careful and we have to ensure that we have to plan for the oxygen and we have to have three oxygen cylinders to go to the top and come back one oxygen cylinder is still the halfway which is called balcony another oxygen cylinder is still the top and in one cylinder you have to come back so it's like a video game now if you can manage your time and oxygen you're alive if you miss on that over you are risking your life like to 50 50 would you want to do that of course not so it's a game of planning it's a game of execution and then when you are going up like that and you see a lot of people turning back there you have to be very strong about your belief not like conforming to what all others are doing your judgment your instinct your analysis of your own body and your capability will make you move forward driven by that strong why towards that unknown and as we go up as we go up you know just when when i reach to the top of that south summit the south summit is the thing that you see from far uh, like you no know, that is not the actual summit from there you have to actually go for another 45 minutes to 1 hour to reach the actual summit just when i thought that mount everest is so easy like and you know, i thought uh, i'll have to do a lot of <laughs> like you know uh, uh, too much uh, struggle and all but it was like you know we were so well acclimatized that we could go so um, fast and uh, i was like making a mockery of mount everest while i was going with my friend and i think mount everest heard that just when i was uh, taking some rest at the top of uh, the south summit first my left eye went blind i got so scared like what happened to my eyes and it was not even day that i'll get a um, like uv reflection and uh, snow blindness and i realized that it was so cold uh, and maybe the pressure difference that my um, the, the liquid inside might have changed the refractive index or some internal hemorrhage just after that when i started again for the south for the actual summit the main lifeline the oxygen that mask went for a toss 
I couldn't breathe the oxygen, the supplemental oxygen. And I thought that maybe the knob got closed or something. So I told my uh, Sherpa friend that, hey, can you see that uh, my knob is uh, probably not working properly? Just can you switch it on? So he checked and he said, no, it's all fine. I told him, is the oxygen got over? And he checked and he said, no, the pressure is fine. Like, you know, it's almost uh, like half oxygen is still there, but I couldn't breathe. Now, when I'm taking it off, I could breathe properly and it was feeling so nice. And this feeling so nice is very bad because it's called hypoxic situation where your brain is getting less oxygen. And when I'm trying to put it back, it's suffocating. Now there were already people behind me and they were like pushing, like go, go, go. And then I thought, okay, on the way, let me go and fix it. Now these oxygen cylinders are uh, like, you know, filled locally. Uh, so a lot of water vapors went inside and the pipe froze in some way way somewhere the, the water vapor and it blocked the oxygen supply and I went on like that for another half an hour till a point where I couldn't bring my finger back and I was getting some cramps in my leg and I realized that if I get a cramp it is very difficult to uh, like you know bring it back to the original state let me prevent that cramp and I clamped myself and I was waiting for some other people and the other climbers who were crossing me thought that I am dying and they were just doing like this and going and saying a silent prayer. And I tried to scream until, no, 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 I'm not dying. I'm not dying. But then it was just another 10 minutes to reach the summit. And uh, my Sherpa came back and he thought that I was, I never needed any help in the whole thing. So he just went to the top and waiting for me. So he couldn't find me. So he came back in search of me and he told that, what are you doing here? come, 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 another 10 minutes. And I told him that, see, my mask is not working. And he came and checked. And he also checked the uh, oxygen pressure and he said, it is all fine. And he thought my mind is gone. And without letting me explain to him, he just left. And I waited for my Sherpa to come, my friend and his Sherpa, he was behind. I was waiting for them to get some oxygen. Now, when they came, I told the Sherpa that, uh, hey, my mask is not working. And then he said, sir, I don't know anything. I just know how to put it and how to take it off. I don't know the internal mechanism, what to do. And I requested him that, can you give me your mask? And he replied, sir, if I give my mask, I will die. Yes. He, though we have hired him, it doesn't mean that he has to give his life for me. And I realized that I am in a soup now. At that point, my other Sherpa came and he started blasting. He was still here like in another 10 minutes. And I told him, look, you are not believing that uh, my mask is not working. And he was silent. And I told him, why don't you try it? And he realized the gravity of the situation and he asked what to do. And I told him, look, I am a person from the plains and it's a fact that last 30 minutes I am still surviving without oxygen and I'm not dead. Now you are a person from the mountains. You give me your mask for 10 minutes and trust me, I'll just take this mask, go to that summit, take a picture and I'll hand over your mask to you. I just need the summit picture because if I have to, I have a choice to die. Let me die after summiting rather than 10 minutes before die, uh, the summit. And he was still doubtful that what if I won't give um, my mask back. And I told him that you are so many people, you beat me, you snatch it from me, but I promise I'll give you your, your mask. And then finally he agreed to give his mask and I took his mask. And after I took that mask, it was like, I felt like a Superman, like I got all the energy back and I started running. I started running and like, you know, overtook a lot many climbers and finally reached to the summit. And then a lot of stories happened at the summit as well. But while I was waiting for my picture to be clicked, I saw my Sherpa coming back, coming towards me again. And I know that I had to give my mask back now. And I stood there. I, I sat there at the top of the summit and I saw him coming. I was looking down and he stood in front of me. And I just took the mask and I just gave him without looking at him. One minute passed, he didn't take back the mask. 
And I was curious, why is they not taking the mask? And when I looked at him, I saw that he was wearing my mask. And I just shouted, how come it is working? Was I like so much uh, affected by the altitude that a working mask, I thought it was not working. To that, he smiled and he pointed to the sun because by the time it is there, it was 545 and the sun just came up and it became warmer. So the block went off and that's how I survived. I could continue with that mask and I could come back alive. But when I came back, I started reflecting that what made me not panic in that situation when my only lifeline that I have is, is not working. Where without oxygen means I'm 100% sure I'm going to die. At that point, it is very natural and very, very uh, justified to panic and run back and turn back to go down. But what made me not panic? And I, I, I was not taking that I am fearless because I, I get scared. I'm not fearless about my life. I want to live, uh, to do climb more mountains and to go those jungles and underwater and everything. So when I was reflecting and reflecting, suddenly I got a realization and that realization was so shocking. I didn't panic a bit because we panic only when an unknown situation comes in front of us, which we are not aware of, which we are not experienced before. But that day when my oxygen mask was gone and I was having less oxygen and I was having breathing trouble, I realized that I have gone through this situation umpteen number of times in the whole childhood from class two till my college days when I was having this asthma and I cursed asthma till, till that day. And that same asthma, which I cursed through my life, actually came to help. And that saved my life. That didn't allow me to panic. And hence, my sense of judgment was not clouded. And I could carry on a dialogue in a much stable state, in a much logical way. And I could do a negotiation with my Sherpa there. And that's how I survived. So the whole paradigm shifted for me. And I realized one thing that not everything that is happening to you, which is appearing to be like crumbling you and the worst thing that can happen to you is happening maybe, but that is actually preparing you for something much bigger. That is actually preparing you to take on life in a much bigger scale. And that may someday save your life too. And with that realization, I actually went and finally summited Mount Everest and I went and climbed all other peaks. And I realized that if you are convinced and if you are having that conviction, every direction that you go is the right direction. Everything is the true north. And this is not a Photoshop picture. This is a picture from the South Pole. So when you go to the South Pole and when you reach to the South Pole, your final destination, any direction you go from there is not, and this is the geographic not. So make yourself so much resilient that you can embrace change. You can embrace the uncertainties and you can take any direction which you believe and every direction will be the right direction. And you can, in the face of this worst and unknown adversities, all you need to do is implanting a belief system that yes, I can, and I have done before, so I can done any number of times. And with that, let not your mediocrity drag you down instead arise. Let not your dreams fall back to mere wishes. That is a silent death to your dreams if it becomes a wish. Instead awake, run for your dreams, make your dreams possible and do whatever it takes to make your, to, to, to dream that impossible dream and to reach that impossible star. And then you will see that everything is possible. Not because your boss believes it is possible, not because your parents believe it is possible, because you believe that it is possible. So dream big and chase your dreams. Thank you. Over to you, Avik. Avik, you are mute.
sorry that was an incredible story satyarup and uh, i'm so glad that i am able to hear that once again and you know each time you hear it it's as if you're reliving uh, you know the your uh, moments on top of everest again and again incredible Thank i so I, much i got the goosebumps that. as well <laughs> yeah, because it's so vivid and it's so lively like you know, i can experience this again and again and i can get all the strength i think that that's incredible and uh, as we do with each of our sessions uh, satyaru we'll have a short q and a round uh, right. from our audience uh, and uh, so one of the things that i want to do i just want to recap some of the things that you said you started off with a very, very nice saying what doesn't kill you makes you stronger you said not to you you decided not to keep the inhaler after the sikkim incident and that kind of you know it's not very easy to do because it's like something it's it's that that is your identity that has been your identity the inhaler is part of who you were yes. cutting it was also a moment of decision you know uh, you you decided even if you decide not to take something with you for the rest of your life that was an incredibly brave decision at that point in time and how you connected it with the everest story you summited everest and that's the time when you reflected later on you figured it was probably all the small little dots of right. all your encounters with an asthma attack which actually okay. made you the person you are on top of everest and uh, that that was an amazing insight and most importantly if your why is not strong enough you will turn back your why which means the purpose i guess that's 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 what you're trying to say and in the end you said with conviction every direction is true north uh, so true so true that if uh, if everybody has a, uh, a conviction that's uh, true north uh, just wanted to share some questions uh, that are coming in for an active person who has to stay indoors what's your advice to stay fit both mentally and physically at this point in time because i believe a lot of organizations have clearly told their employees stay at home till end of this year right okay? so there are lots of organizations which are doing that stay at home and uh, so obviously you can see an entire workforce that will spend almost a good part of 10 months staying at home not going to office so what's your advice here look uh, you have to accept the situation and instead of cribbing try to use the maximum uh, try to maximize uh, the situation right uh, what i can say is um, like you know we have gone through situations like this lockdown when we are in the mountains we get stuck in a small tent 6 feet by 6 feet and for days we have to stay inside because the weather outside is bad and to even go for a toilet is a luxury and uh, with minimal food and that is our kind of lockdown and here at least i can go from here to there to that room i have a connectivity in internet i have a phone call i can work from home i can earn we are privileged <laughs> right it's not that bad so yes uh, physical distancing is there but social distancing is not there and now you can travel cut down your travel time like you know earlier i remember in bangalore i used to travel for one and a half hours each side so 3 hours was gone now in this 3 hours you can do a lot of things like you can do like you know i have been doing the last 2 uh, months i have been doing a yoga every alternate days and the other days i am doing some activities and all in in fact in this time when i thought that i have nothing else to do today uh, like yesterday we have created a helpline number for all the covid uh, um, affected people who can get the support the counseling uh the consulting with a lot of doctors and all so if you have the intent to do something even in the time of this uh, uh, like you know in this uncertainty you will be able to find your way out you will be able to do things only if you have the intent to do it so look beyond what is going on happening it is evident what is it that is coming out as an opportunity what opportunity can you create for yourself in this particular situation once you do that and once you bring that growth mindset you will see that uh, this became a boon for you rather than a bane like you know so that's all i can uh, tell you and uh, yes i patient space and i am waiting that when this situation will be better and i will go back to the mountains and i am preparing for those mountains even better than any other times so i know next time when i go to the mountain 
I'll be double stronger. Now I'll tell you, yes, disappointment was there. Last year I went to North Pole. I had to turn back from there because of the problems between Russia and Ukraine. Now would I curse it and stay lifelong like that? So what I did was I again planned this year. I had all the tickets. I had all the bookings. I had made all the payments, taking loans and everything. And the COVID came in. Again, it shattered my dreams. But then we are humans. We can create our dreams again. So I know that next time when I go, I'll be three times more uh, desperate to go for that uh, to make it happen. Like you know. So I use that as my fuel, that anger and that thing to my fuel. And I know that I'll be even more fitter, even more stronger to go. And maybe I can append some more things. Maybe with that South Pole, I can do a Greenland uh, skiing as well. And and with the North Pole, I can do the Greenland skiing as well. So it all depends on how you see that particular situation. Absolutely, so true. Uh, what is the most challenging situation that you have overcome in your life apart from asthma? Of course, overcoming asthma has been one of your greatest uh, uh, victories, uh, if I can put it that way. But can you? Cite any other example? Yes, one more you gave was on top of Mount Everest. But apart from Everest, did any of the other mountains that you've climbed, and you've climbed almost fourteen of those high peaks, uh, is there any other mountain that that has posed a massive challenge for you uh, uh, during your climbs? To be honest, uh, um, I have two very vivid memories. One is uh, going to Mount Denali, which is the highest mountain of North America. and since we didn't had money and already my i have taken i have exhausted all that resources i had uh, by that time so we went unguided and unsupported to that mountain and eventually that became one of the fastest climbs from india and uh, not because we wanted to prove a bravado but we didn't had money to go so we uh, so that was something that you know gave me a lot of belief system that yes i'm prepared for everest i'm prepared for even bigger mountains because we embraced the challenges we embraced the uncertainty and it was not at all Uh, uh uh something like um um uh, unplanned we planned to the minutest of details and uh, uh we identified all the risks and we started mitigating one by one by one and we knew that let's take one day at a time one day at a time and we put small small targets and went another one was uh, so i fell down in a crevasse in everest <laughs> so that's uh, for another day uh, but it's very insightful So uh, was it was, on the Khumbu icefall yes, yes. region? Uh, wow. Yes, after the Khumbu, and I was hanging there for half an hour. <laughs> my God, incredible! Yeah. So was that on your way back, or while you were attempting? Oh, the while I was uh, going on my second iteration uh, to Mount Everest, so nobody okay. was there. Incredible! We'll keep there. that story for <laughs> another another day over. Uh, and there are uh, plenty so which that, I actually. share in my uh, uh, other workshops. Uh, there are absolutely. plenty of uh, absolutely. Yeah, we are coming to that. We'll come to. Uh, we'll talk about your workshops as well. Uh, before that, I have a question from Syed Ahmed. He asks. when we undertake such adventurous trips with defining moments one of the constant worries is what's happening back at home and in office how do we stay focused now imagine the guy in the borders of kashmir when he is fighting the enemies and as he just ready for marching into the enemy ground he cannot afford to think that oh i am a father now he cannot afford to think that oh i am someone's dad now he has to think that this is the role that he is now working he is a soldier now so nothing else should drag him down nothing else no other baggage should come so when you are there be in the present and stay focused for that action you have all the time to think of all those things much before in the planning stage uh, and that's why in mount everest also we don't even have the capability to think so all those thoughts oh what will happen and all has to happen in the base camp not in the war front not in the on the mountains when you are crossing those narrow strips you cannot afford to think that so that has to happen with experience once you expose yourself to smaller challenges then little bigger challenges then little bigger challenges so yeah like we don't think of then then we couldn't have taken one single step <laughs> you know you make it sound very easy but i'm sure it's it's got to do with training the mind a lot yes uh, and over a long period of time that it just doesn't happen i mean one day you just don't wake up and go to everest so i guess that entire years of training uh, in the mountains overall teaches you how to remain focused and how to stay disciplined uh, up in the mountain that's probably one way of 
uh, kind of cutting down all any other thoughts that might impede your uh, uh, journey forward. Uh, here's another from uh, Sanjay. Uh, he says, uh, great leaders are in a way lauded for their success. But can it also be said that what makes these leaders is trials of failures of resilience building? So have you kind of, I mean, you, we've, we've seen your achievements, but you, have you also failed going up any of the mountains or all of them you attempted, uh, you reached on first attempt? No, Mount Everest, which was my dream, you know, it was my dream, like when I saw Mount Everest in 2010, and I put everything at stake for Mount Everest and every step that I used to take, like from buying a uh, new t-shirt to a new trouser, I used to think that, you know what, let me buy a checking pant and a checking t-shirt because that will help me towards going to Mount Everest. Every single, my career decision and this and that was all aligned to that dream. And when finally I could arrange money from somewhere here, there, and like, and I don't know, like how I managed that money. And I gave it everything of mine, everything at stake. And I was almost about to reach my dream destination. And I just was at Gorakship in Mount Everest, this camp. A big earthquake happened in Nepal. That was in the year 2015. 15 years. And, you know, with that one minute earthquake, uh, uh, a little more, 10,000 people in Nepal died. And then it triggered a huge avalanche in the base camp of Everest and shattered, like, and it killed 21 people there. And it strangled our dreams. It shattered our dreams into millions of pieces. And all the money was lost. All the dreams was lost. And I couldn't believe that the expedition was over. I couldn't even start and it got over and it was so tormenting and I, I was in a phase of denial and uh, in, in some workshop I do take this uh, as a separate subject altogether where how in this midst of uh, situation where everything seemed to crumble down how do you get back your faith how do you restore your faith how do you rekindle your hope and how do you come back again stronger doubly stronger and like, you know, so yes, uh, there had been many, many times uh, this has happened and I couldn't uh, climb a mountain which I intended to climb and I turned back uh, only to come back later as a much stronger, stronger person. Yeah. Uh, Satyar, you've been talking about your dreams because everything around your life is one dream after another, after another. You know, it's your, your life makes so much sense uh, because you're pursuing your dreams constantly and that's what I guess keeps you, you know, feeling alive, gives you that sense of uh, aliveness at every moment that you live. Uh, do you really articulate these dreams or they are just there in your mind? Do you write it down somewhere? Uh, how do you kind of, uh, you know, put it down? Do you give it fixed timelines? How do you go about planning your dreams? So I had no idea about seven summits, right? So uh, I went to Everest Base Camp and I, um, I, I got exposed to Everest. Then I went for uh, getting a training for Everest. Uh, uh, like I went for Himalayan Mountain Institute to do my training only to know that this training is not enough to achieve my dreams. And then I thought, uh, let me try some other mountains. And Africa used to fascinate me a lot. And uh, I realized that Kilimanjaro is climbable and it's a starting peak. Let me do that. And while I was searching about Kilimanjaro, I suddenly got that Kilimanjaro is a part of the seven summits. And I was like, I heard that first time the term seven summits. And I was so inquisitive. I went into that Wikipedia and I saw that. And I was like blown away, like <laughs> highest mountains of all the seven continents. Wow, what an excuse to roam around the world. And you know, I forgot about the facts and figures. I forgot about how much it costs and all. I started looking these, 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 these mountains. And I thought, okay, first I'll do this, then next year this, then this. And I created a timeline for myself. And then suddenly I came back to reality and I like, I don't have money for going to one mountain like Mount Everest because it was so costly. And here I'm thinking about climbing seven mountains. But then I didn't want it to uh, leave that dream, like, you know, which I already saw and like, you know, which I already framed. And then I thought to myself that, you know, it's like infinity. You add anything to infinity, it's still infinity. You multiply anything to infinity, it's still infinity. So Everest was anyways an infinity for me. So why not add some more mountains to it? It still remains infinity. So it's like, if I can dream of going to Mars, 
why not to jupiter and pluto like you know <laughs> why not to some other solar system so i think that uh, i realized um, is the key for me to allow myself to dream bigger because most of us we don't allow ourselves to dream so we see that oh that's not my cup of tea and then i i just leave it from my consciousness itself from my awareness itself then how will i go and pursue the dream so whenever i dream something and my dreams oh my god <laughs> that scares me and i have so many things to do in this one life that i feel like every day i should be doing something like you know i i i i try to utilize every moment of my life but yeah uh, it's very important to leave those dreams to visualize those and to make it in a, as a part of yourself and you and your dreams are not two different entities then and you become one and you will see that it's just it's a matter of time that it happens so that's how absolutely. i offer it absolutely in fact coming to the next question it's about uh, the training that you asked but this question says are you conducting any leadership work uh, workshops in the outdoors please uh, share some key learnings from these leadership summits in fact uh, viewers as a matter of fact uh, satya roop and uh, owl outdoor wilderness uh, wilderness learnings we are collaborating on two very interesting projects next year uh, satya roop will be leading two leadership uh, summits uh, next year and uh, so one is on the 4th of may which is the world asthma day the 4th of may 2021 he'll be leading uh, one of our collaborative uh, treks to the everest base camp and the second one uh will be on the 5th of june 2021 uh on the world environment day he'll be leading a trek to mount kilimanjaro so here are two that uh, satyaru and aul are collaborating on so would you like to uh, talk a little bit about these two uh, ventures of ours uh, next year uh, satyaru right so uh, everest base camp is one of those most beautiful trails in the world and it is in the top 10 trails in the world and uh, trust me it changed my life forever it changed the direction of my life forever and i always insist people that you know you should uh, have this life changing experience and uh, a few months back i took a group of entrepreneurs and it was so beautiful to see them uh, like you know coming out of their comfort zone and seeing them transform and getting their breakthroughs in the whole journey to from a place where they thought they can they have never done a trek before so i trained them on the uh, like you know physical side as well as the mental side it's very important this is very important because uh, uh, without this mental strength all your physical strength will just be limited to your gym itself like you know nothing else in the application Absolutely. but when i saw these people transform and this transformation is a lifelong transformation and when i see them now what a drastic change they have gone through and what a clarity they got in their life and they exactly know what they are here they found their purpose and all and it's, it's such a beautiful uh, trip uh, i would recommend people uh, like you know definitely to join that particular trek because it's not just a trek but it's a breakthrough journey it's a journey to rediscover yourself to understand yourself to get a clarity of your thoughts to get a breakthroughs all over every single day you will uh, see a new aspects of your life which you never you never thought it is possible and then coming to kilimanjaro Kilimanjaro is uh, the highest uh, uh, the tallest uh, free standing mountain in the world and it is the highest mountain uh, of Africa and it it's a part of one of the seven summits and uh, in february i took a group of uh, ceos and cfos there and earlier i have taken my friends also there and uh, just from the like you know breaking the inhibitions and breaking the self limiting belief and when you see them transform using those and it's so beautiful to see them all of them on the top of kilimanjaro and you'll see people like uh, coming to their tears and like you know shouting and like you know finding a new themselves which ne- they never saw before and it's magical so if you have to experience uh, uh, these and like you know and leadership what i believe cannot be honed cannot be honed in four walls in a training room you have to come to this kind of places where it pushes out of your comfort zone and you will explore traits of yourself which you never got an opportunity to explore and you will find a new yourself and personal leadership happens only when you have the personal leadership then only you will have the broader leadership to lead a team 
so uh, i look forward to your participation for these leadership uh, retreats at kilimanjaro and everest base camp on the world asthmatic day as well as on the world environment day so yeah over to you avik yeah uh, thank you actually um, um, we are pretty excited at all about these two workshops uh, next year so viewers even if you are not a mountaineer even if you are not an ardent trekker right now or even if you are not physically in your prime uh, uh, it doesn't matter you have almost a year to work on it and remember satya roop story he wasn't born a climber he developed it much later i mean at the age of 25 or 26 he probably for the first time he climbed a small little hillock uh, somewhere in tamil nadu and for that boy to go on and climb everest uh, uh, you know surmounting the kind of odds that he has been through that's an incredible story very inspirational uh, uh, story as well so viewers will guide you over the next course of one year uh, train you mentally and then set up examples of how you can you know do an exercise regime etc so that one day you can be standing on top of mount kilimanjaro or you can be at the everest base camp looking up at the mountain itself with a sense of pride uh, and achievement uh, so on that note uh, satyarup thank you so much for being with us but uh, satyarup's uh, talk today was in a bridge version of his powerful workshops on breakthroughs in life he also has workshops around redesigning your life and dreaming big so please get in touch with us for engaging satyarup for his workshop or any other workshops satyarup a big thank you to you it was a delight listening to you and your fantastic adventure stories and thank you for gracing our chat today uh, we wish you good health and we hope to see you soon uh, thank you so you much again. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity. Really appreciate. It. See you soon. So, uh, viewers, if you want to know more about us, do contact us. The details are in the YouTube channel itself. And thank you for watching today's session, brought to you by Owl. Stay tuned for more such meaningful sessions with thought leaders and achievers every Saturday at 11 a.m. Until the next session, stay healthy, stay safe. Goodbye.